Roger Scruton, a late British philosopher and writer, was one of the most prolific critics of modernity in contemporary thought. His assessments of modernity were multifaceted, touching upon art, architecture, music, politics, and culture. He saw the shifts in modern thought as a departure from values, norms, and traditions that have grounded and enriched societies for centuries. For Scruton, modernity was not merely an epic defined by technological advancement or novel social constructs. It was a radical break from a sense of continuity, both with nature and with the cultural inheritance of the past. Modern art, architecture, and music, in his view, often failed to capture the transcendent and the enduringly human, instead celebrating transgression, alienation, and the ephemeral. In the political and social realms, the embrace of abstract rights and egoism, he believed, led to a neglect of communal bonds, shared duties, and the organic ties that bind people to places and to one another. I actually wanted to say something else in response to what Rory said, which I think is very important. He referred to the transfer of populations from small villages to great megalopolis, uh, and um, how this causes enormous disruption and produces in itself a, a search for status of a new kind. But I think I would just like to reflect on the fact that the, the great cities that have grown in the modern world have also brought along with themselves an art and a literature of loneliness. You know, a, a loneliness of a new kind, which you find in, already in Balzac, but also in Flaubert, uh, and of course, paradigmatically, in people like uh, Kafka and so on, in the Central European tradition. Uh, uh, and it's as though our need for each other uh, which is the thing that is most beautiful in human beings, is suddenly cut off from its, from its fulfillment at the very moment when it, when it can be so easily fulfilled by its, in so many ways. And I think this is a most interesting uh, uh, thing to reflect upon. Uh, uh, you know, that, this is the major transition that, that, we have, that, that, that modernity has imposed upon us. Uh, this mass society where we're surrounded at every point by opportunities, by people, by uh, opportunities of friendship and, uh, and also opposition and so on. And at the same time, there has grown within that this uh, unassuageable core, core of loneliness. That very, very interesting thing. I mean, beautiful point. It, when I moved to London, I grew up in the Welsh borders, I gained enormously in terms of financial capital, but in social capital I became rapidly impoverished. I have friends in London who I've known since the age of seven, probably about ten of them. There's nobody I can really call on now to pick me up from the airport this evening, with the possible exception of my wife. Okay. So in terms of you know, the favour economy, all those economies die out and are replaced by the commercialisation of everything. Another very interesting correlation is, if you look at American voting patterns, um, far bigger than race, sexual orientation or anything else is simply where you live. If you live in a, in a town or city over 600,000, you're overwhelmingly Democrat. If you don't, you're overwhelmingly Republican. Now, what you derive from that, you could say that arguably rural communities actually find that, you know, what you might call free market capitalism actually works fairly well and is a fairly amiable part of their lives and they're content with it, that everybody in larger cities feels that something desperately needs to change. But to what they're attributing their dissatisfaction may be entirely the wrong thing. Roger Scruton also emphasizes in his writing that British conservative values emphasize organic evolution, respect for the past, and a commitment to enduring principles that transcend momentary shifts in popular opinion. This sense got boldened by how the British overcame the war with Nazi Germany. We, the British, had successfully defended our sovereignty uh, against uh, Nazi aggression and had not been occupied. All other nations, save Spain, Portugal, and Sweden, which uh, maintained a kind of neutrality, uh, had suffered defeat and or occupation. Uh, and uh, this means uh, there's an enormous difference in the underlying psyche of the British people, in particular my parents' generation, who had fought that war, protected our country, came, from it, uh, came away from that war with a sense of having achieved what they set out to do, which was to protect our freedom, independence, and sovereignty from a major uh, threat to which other countries had succumbed. And I think uh, uh, this means that, that there, we start from a different premise. 
the premise that we have earned our freedom, we've defended our freedom, and in doing so, defended Europe. Uh, the European values against the most recent attempt uh, to submerge them, which was the attempt of the Nazis. Of course, then there was the attempt of the communists, which is another question coming later for, for most of us. Uh, so the motives for us, British people, to surrender our sovereignty to a transnational body politic were inevitably different, uh, even if they existed at all. They weren't the same motives as the Germans had or the French had, who had survived occupation uh, and the enmity between them and wanted a new kind of reconciliation. We didn't need that reconciliation because we'd never been forced to, to, to uh, have it thrust upon us. So um, our parents asked the question, was the fight worth it just to give in, just to surrender that thing that we had spent our lives and uh, fortunes on defending. And I think that question has always been in the back of uh, the minds of the British people as one reason why they've been skeptical about attempts to take national sovereignty away. Roger Scruton believed that British conservatism and classical liberalism shared foundational principles. He saw both as valuing the individual's freedom and the importance of the rule of law, safeguarded within the context of a shared cultural and historical inheritance. For Scruton, British conservatism, emphasis on tradition and societal bonds complemented rather than contradicted the liberal emphasis on personal liberty and autonomy. But conservatism, at least as we in Britain have inherited it, is compatible with classical liberalism, but not with left liberalism and not with libertarianism. That, uh, that, um, uh, the classical liberal position is something which can exist, coexist with a conservative attitude to the social order, but um, uh, left liberalism and libertarianism are not compatible with the conservative attitude. Now, uh, this is really quite important because when, uh, when Mrs. Thatcher was in office as our Prime Minister, uh, she was often criticized uh, by people, especially on the left, uh, for being essentially a, an anti-social force. You know, her kind of uh, uh, emphasis on liberal economics and free market principles was regarded as also posing a threat to the moral order. And it was a very uh, useful argument for people on the left to make because it was a way of uh, conscripting old-fashioned conservatives who would have voted for Mrs. Thatcher to uh, to feel suspicious of her. You know that yes, we shouldn't introduce market principles into every area of social life because that just undermines the traditions and the uh, uh, conventions on which the moral order depends. Now, actually, that argument uh, was made uh, early on in the, by Marx in the Communist Manifesto, which begins with this kind of um, encomium of bourgeois society, saying that, uh, that under the, under the r uh, rule of capitalist uh, uh, production, all the old principles and old forms of life and old traditions and customs are blown apart. Uh, society is fragmented and the ground is prepared for the new revolutionary movement that will replace capitalism with, uh, with some form of socialist econ economic order. Uh, and um, that argument constantly recurs. You know that liberal, li the liberal position involves the defense of the free market against traditional forms of order, and therefore is a threat to the conservative position which wants to maintain traditional forms of order. However, in um, the intellectual tradition of British conservatism, uh, classical liberalism has been always combined with some kind of conservatism. In uh, Edmund Burke, for instance, uh, who was the founding father, I, I suppose, of modern conservatism in, in Britain, uh, in, in Edmund Burke, you find a defense of liberal economics with uh, conservative thoughts about about the social order. And Burke did not regard these as incompatible. He thought that, on the contrary, they stem from the same uh, original in insight, uh, the insight which, it, uh, which we could express by saying that 
human beings owe their individuality and their freedom to the social conditions in which they are uh, brought up. That we, that we are not born free, as Rousseau thought, but we become free through our immersion in social uh, traditions and, uh, and customs. Uh, that we are made free by our social membership, and it all depends upon the kind of social membership as to how free we will be. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy videos like this, please subscribe and hit the notification bell.